Are we live? Yeah. I'm I didn't hear sure. a 10 second count. I didn't hear a 10 second count either. I think that's what he just said. It was like, you, you're supposed to. <laughs> What's good? I was watching everybody. the box. <laughs> it's okay. We could just take it from the top because we're live and everybody understands that mistakes happen when you're live. What's good, everybody? And welcome to a very special episode of What's Good Games live on GameSpot's Charity for All live stream going for several weeks. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Christine Steimer. Hello. Brittany Brombacher. Hello. And special guest, GameSpot's Callie Plaguey is here. Hey. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we are excited that you are here as well. And apologies, to everybody. I know that Rihanna Manuel was going to join us as well. And unfortunately, she had some last minute things come up and she's not going to be joining our discussion today. But don't worry, she'll be back with us on another episode of WGG very soon. And we have a lot of fun stuff that we're going to be doing today, including raising money for some fantastic causes. Callie, you can tell us all about that. You've got all the details, right? I can. So for Play For All, we are raising money from two different causes, Black Lives Matter and Direct Relief for COVID-19. You can see the links in the description. They are bit.ly links, so it'll be bit.ly, um, gs-blm, and then for Direct Relief, it's bit.ly, gs slash, and it's covered by the mute icon. So I'm going to hop over to my little thing and read it out, gs-covid. So, um, you know, we are, we've been raising money for a while and we accept anything at all. Um, every bit counts. So thank you in advance for anyone who donates. We'll be reading the donations later. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great cause and we're, we're really proud to be doing it. I mean, we're proud to be part of it. We've been really fortunate to be able to work with GameSpot for their E3 coverage for the last couple of years. And obviously, since there's no E3 this year, you guys are doing things differently. I think everybody's doing things a bit differently. And the idea that we get to still be involved with GameSpot while also raising money for some fantastic causes, I think is a win-win. Right, ladies? Absolutely. Win-win, win-win, win-win. I'm admittedly, live production's great. I don't see us on our Twitch channel. I see us on our Twitch channel. You do? Yeah. Well, I do. Heck? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Try a good refresh on your browser page, everybody. No. You're like Brittany, <laughs> and you're listening to this, and you're like, I can't see it. Uh, a good old refresh usually does the trick. Uh, well, you can watch us in a variety of sources, and if you happen to miss part of the stream today, don't worry. We will be uploading this on our What's Good Games channel and on our What's Good Games podcast apps, of course. So if you guys are excited for our discussion today, if you may have missed it, we're going to be talking about games of the year so far. So, the, so Callie, this is an annual tradition for us here at What's Good Games. We usually do it right around now, usually the first weekend of July or the last weekend of June to kind of take the temperature of where we're at for the year and 2020 so far has been a pretty excellent year for games but i want everybody watching I'm glad you qualified that what <laughs> for, 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 yeah, for, for games, for games. Yeah. Um, yeah i don't really need to get into all the reasons 2020 hasn't been a good year for a variety of other reasons there's a reason why we're raising money for some awesome charities today and it's because 2020 hasn't been great for everybody so before we get into our discussion i want everybody live watching live to know that we will be taking your questions after our discussion so if you have specific questions about a game that we discuss or if you are like i can't believe you missed this game please let us know you can drop those questions in the chat and we have some awesome folks on the GameSpot side that are going to be keeping track of those shout out to chastity we love you chastity love chastity she's the best um, so we kind of narrowed it down to five key games that we think are good contenders for game of the year so far. But before we get into that, is there any other housekeeping that I feel like I'm missing? Brittany, uh, anything? Uh, Kelly, anything? I mean, no. I mean, we've already talked about our What's Good Game summer break that we're going on. We I did. Think, you know, so yeah, like, I think we're good. It feels weird not to have a gajillion things down the pipe, you know? I know. Uh, well, so we usually start our show with about 15 minutes of announcement. <laughs> yeah. Real. Sometimes people are good with it and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they oh, leave no. us with one star Why? review. Why do you talk for 15 minutes in the beginning? That's why we have timestamps, ladies and gentlemen. They're there for you. Help yourself. It's true. <laughs> 
But you guys see the links on screen if you are wondering why you or where you need to go to donate. And uh, we will be calling out those donations, as Callie mentioned. Uh, we're going to take a break in the middle of our conversation to do some donation callouts, and then we will finish the rest of the callouts at the end of the show. But we're not going to take a bunch of breaks in the middle because we want to keep the conversation flowing. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with games of the year so far in the year 2020. So the first game on the list is a sequel, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. So this is developed by Moon Studios and was published on Xbox and PC. And it came out early this year. And I was incredibly excited that this game was made. And I love so much about this game. But before I get into my thoughts, ladies, what did you feel about Ori and the Will of the Wisps? I did not play it. <laughs> so no. really Brittany feels nothing. Showing. I feel nothing. I'm showing. Smile and nod and agree with you both. Oh, me too. Oh. I uh, yeah did not play yeah. it shamefully. It's a beautiful game. I can say that. Where's my shame? Where's my shame bell? I don't no, know. You one. I know. I need to get one to have it on set. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Am I the only one that's played Ori and the Will of the Wisps? I played it. I, I'm only. I'm like halfway. I made it like halfway, three quarters of the way, and then stopped playing. Oh no! Okay, so <laughs> it was also because I, I just got, I lost patience, and like patience is not a thing I typically have to begin with. So that's always been a struggle for me in the Ori games. But I, I really love them in general. Um, just sometimes my fingers don't move as fast as I want them to. <laughs> I totally don't blame you for, you know, having some issues with the platforming mechanics. But here's the thing that's great about this game. And first off, just look at how beautiful this game is. The art style in this game is phenomenal. I really loved the Blind Forest as well. And I think that they really elevated the gameplay and also the level design in Will of the Wisps. Really, uh, to me, a standout example of a classic Metroidvania modernized for audiences that maybe never even heard of Castlevania or played the original Metroids, right? Oh, baby so, gamers. Well, <laughs> we the against baby gamers I here. Know. But what I really love about this game and why I think it's a game of the year contender is because I think that they really did a great job of giving people more accessibility options this time around than they did in the first game. And that makes the game more approachable for people. And the story of Ori and everything that Ori has to overcome and the story of the villain in the game and what the villain is going through and, and how they really showed the other side of that villain's story without you know giving it away if you guys want to go back and play it, I think is really impactful and really powerful. And I thought there was a lot of really emotional moments in this game mixed with these really sometimes controller throwing, frustrating moments of platforming mechanics. And what I think was great about this game is that even if you use a lot of the accessibility options, it doesn't make the game easy. It makes the game easier for people who need those accessibility options while still providing challenges because some of the timing challenges with the jump mechanics, there's no way to get around them. It's like you just have to keep practicing and practicing and practicing. And I think that's what people look for in a good platforming game is that satisfaction of, okay, I die and have to do it again. I die and have to do it again. And then you finally overcome the challenge and are able to succeed. And I think that the game really re rewards you for those successes and also encourages you to do exploration in areas of the map that you don't necessarily need to go to, but you're like, hey, maybe I can go see if there's another upgrade over there. Or maybe I want to go look at this other world design. And even just in this short little piece of gameplay that we see here, which I believe, Callie, this is from the review on GameSpot.com, right? It is, yes. Is it really shows the diversity of the art environments and the level design. And you get a couple boss fights here. Some of them were super fun and super challenging. And I just can't say enough about how much I absolutely adored this game. And I'm so glad that this game exists. And if you guys have not taken the time to check out or in the blind forest, I really just can't can't convince you more than I hopefully have right now that you should. And while I want to look at this as a game of the year contender, I fully know that it doesn't have a chance at winning this year. <laughs> I'm gonna have a lot of uh, big hitters. But if we were going to vote today, I think that at least would deserve a nomination for everything that the team at Moon did for this game. I hope at least gets, at the very least, I hope it gets some art nods because mm -hmm. clearly, as you see, like, 
I think their use of color and shadow like is really intelligent and really beautiful. So, uh, and it's not something that you see in every game. Although it's scale it's to too. Goodness, yeah, sense of scale is really good. Absolutely. What I thought was really neat about the way that they did the map is that you can zoom in and out and actually like will zoom into the mountainside and then pull back and give you like a, a larger view. So you're not just seeing like a grid overview to help you find your way. They really made it artistic. And I feel like those small touches are sprinkled throughout this game and really make it soar and those are the kind of small details that i think you look for when you talk about game of the year versus just a game that's really fun to play and we will be talking about games that are fun to play of course and we love those games but i think everybody has different qualifications for what game of the year means for them and kelly you do a lot of reviews and you have to think critically about a lot of games do you have a specific set of categories or a specific set of like bullet points you kind of look for when you're looking for game of the year contenders um no no i i i wouldn't say i have like a criteria when i when i'm thinking about game of the year i think a lot about uh the way the game made me feel more than anything else. Um, and that's something that's not really quantifiable. And it, I, I guess it kind of goes against what you would expect from reviews, because obviously at GameSpot, we score our reviews. There is a sense of, of you know, an eight or above could qualify for game of the year kind of thing. But um, for me, it's it's more about like, what did the game make me feel? When I walked away from this game, what did I admire about it? What did I appreciate about it? Um, and that shifts for me throughout the year. So I really like doing these conversations in the middle of the year because um, last year was really interesting for me. I, I think I didn't really know what my game of the year was until I played Disco Elysium. And then I was like, that's my game of the year. Oh, um, I want to play that so bad. It is so good. And um, that game, like, you know, it just, it set itself apart. It gave me a feeling that other games didn't. So I know that's very abstract, but um, that's that's often what I'm looking for is, is what about this game captured me? And I, I don't mean like a game that's like really story heavy and emotional. I just mean like how satisfied was I by the gameplay and like how well does that gameplay mesh with what the game was trying to do and, and that kind of thing. So um, I, that's probably not very helpful, but um, it's, no, it's definitely yeah, helpful. Yeah. I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head. The satisfaction element, I think, is a big part of that, right? Because you want to walk away going, that game is going to stick with me because it felt so good. And I think that that's a great qualifier. I'm thinking about Ori and why I didn't play it. I think it was because we had just got back from PAX East, right? This game came out March. So I think we just came back from PAX East. And I remember I was really sick. Doctor said it was bronchitis. bronchitis. I think it was probably the COVID, but I digress. <laughs> I digress. It was real bad. Uh, but I remember, and it's funny that Simon was talking about it because she, the way she described Ori at one point was it's very frustrating. She, this isn't the game where you threw a controller, right? This was, I threw a controller in Blind Forest. I didn't throw okay. a controller in Will of the Wisps, at least at the point that I'm at in the game. Although I did run into a weird thing where, so I thought I was doing this one part correctly because it would work every fourth time so i thought the game was broken and i was like what is happening this is busted and it keeps auto killing me and i feel like it shouldn't so eventually i finally i don't know why i didn't think of this before i just looked it up on youtube <laughs> i like <laughs> i watched someone else do it and i was like oh my god i'm doing like i'm not doing the thing that i should be doing all i have to do is jump on this fucking thing instead of like oh sorry i'm not sure <laughs> for um I jump it's on okay. the <laughs> <laughs> and uh, instead of using I was using like the I don't know what the ricochet kind of move he has um, and I didn't need to be doing that I was making it more complicated actually than it was which is funny uh, but I also thought it was weird that it worked sometimes and then didn't work other times huh. the, game, the game was trying to tell me no you don't, you're doing this you're yeah, making it for yourself but I wasn't listening I think for me, it was just, I was just not in the mood for a Metroidvania platformer. I was in the mood for Yakuza, and that's actually when I, that's right, that's when I started my Yakuza binge. Yeah. Nothing, nothing, nothing could stop me except for Resident Evil 3. <laughs> I, I think I had Animal Crossing by the time Ori came out, uh, and I was reviewing it, so I was like, I couldn't play anything else, but also I had just moved. So that's my defense. <laughs> we all have building defense. furniture. <laughs> 
Yes, that was your your frustration element was building furniture. You exactly. Maxed out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess I'll let all of you off the hook for not playing Ori in the Will of the Wisps. I played, I just didn't finish it. But now you've got summer break and there's time. So go back. And if you're watching live and you missed it, hopefully even just looking at the beautiful gameplay has reminded you, oh yeah, that thing came out. Maybe I should play that game. So let's move on then to our second game since Brittany so eloquently almost gave me a transition there. And I'll let you go ahead and introduce Resident Evil 3 Remake. I will do that. Also, just FYI, I got a message from Chastity who said she also thinks our Twitch channel is offline. Okay, well, I'm watching it, I'm watching it on my computer. On twitch.tv slash what's good games? I sure am. Yep. That's so weird. It's still not showing up for me. Anyway, I don't know what's going on, Chastity. I hear you, girl. I see you, girl. All right. Let's talk about Resident Evil 3. So I'm kind of on the fence with this one in the sense that I think it was a really great survival horror game. But compared to what Resident Evil 2 did, it, it just didn't hold a candle. It didn't live up to it. So Resident Evil 3 Remake is a remake of the Resident Evil 3 game on PlayStation 1 that came out in 98 or 99. And this game follows Jill Valentine, who is a member of Stars, and her first appearance into this series was in Resident Evil 1. Uh, that was the first game in the series. And then obviously a lot of people are familiar with Resident Evil 2, which follows Chris, or not Chris, Leon and Claire. And then Resident Evil 3, you drop, jump in as Jill. So I think this game did a lot of things really great. And this is, this is a story of escaping Raccoon City because shit's about to go down. Who would have thought in a survival horror game in a city overrun and infested with zombies? That thing's just- Ah, big scary dude. Big, ah, oh, Nemi, <laughs> my baby. Yes, all scary dude. This is why I didn't play this game. <laughs> okay, you, never touched, you never even touched it, did you? No, oh my God, what is that? Oh, those things were terrifying and horrible. There's a mm. lot of terrifying and horrible things. In yeah, this there, game. there's there's a very good reason why I didn't play this. Because <laughs> I have enough nightmares on my own. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so again, I want to talk, I want to focus too on how this game did do some good things, but then of course I have to get into things that didn't do so well, which is why I don't think it's a true game of the year contender, especially with this lineup of games we have coming in the rest of 2020 and some of the games that have come out already. So I think it did a really great job of expanding the characters of Jill, Carlos, Tyrell, Mikhail, these characters who in the first Resident Evil, well, in the original Resident Evil 3, didn't have much of a personality. They were just very boring, kind of one-liner, one-dimensional characters that didn't um, they have, there was some chemistry there, but it wasn't anything, you know, to write home about. Again, this was a survival horror game of the late nineties. Like, I don't yeah, think anyone was like really, Bigfoot. yeah, no one was really expecting like, oh my God, this is such brilliant Friday. <laughs> but I think they did a great job with that. I think Nemesis new design is terrifying. I think it's interesting how they evolved him as a, uh, as a bad guy in terms of different forms that they give him and whatnot. The sound design, which is no surprise, like it was in Resident Evil 2, is phenomenal. You know, whether or not it's hearing, you know, Nemesis kind of coming at you, or if it's the creaking of a floorboard or something falling down an alley down the street, you know, there's always something going on that's keeping you on edge. It's only in those little safe rooms where I feel like you have that moment of reprieve. And even then, if it's not a typical safe room, uh, you will not be safe in there, which I found out the hard way. There were some interesting new locations like Jill's apartment, there was the Nest 2, there's a few other buildings within the city, which I think when you think of a remake, you want expansion. You want, especially with what they did with Resident Evil 2, right? You want expand on all of the things that we loved about and modernize it and make it appealing today. Uh, so this game is currently on a 79 or 80 on Metacritic. If you're going to look at Resident Evil 2, that's currently at a 91. So definitely there was something, something that was off. And I think what a lot of it has to do with is that some of the, well, part of it is a lot of the iconic locations of this game were cut, unfortunately. There was the clock tower, the cemetery, the raccoon park, the raccoon Pre city press. And it's, I feel like if this game just had a little bit more development time, it could have 100% been up there with a game of the year contender. There was just, I feel like too many little shortcuts that were taken that uh, unfortunately worked against it. And while I still think it's a really great game, it's just, didn't live up to RE2, you know? I'm not enjoying this footage that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, Cyber, why not? Let's I don't like seeing someone's neck get eaten. That's not 
you know, high up on my list of things to have done to me in my life. I mean, that's fair. I, I, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with you <laughs> on, on that note whatsoever. Um, I love that this game exists. I never thought that I would say that. I think after my amazing experience with Resident Evil 2 Remake, it gave me a renewed sense of interest in Resident Evil, which I know makes Britney very happy and proud. And I think that Capcom absolutely deserves you know, a pat on the back for making this game look so incredible. And the atmosphere building, as Brittany was mentioning, is really well done. I am with you though, Britt, that while I think that this game absolutely deserves like a tip of the hat for job well done, I don't think that it really has a chance against some of the other contenders in 2020 to actually win anything outside of maybe an art award or a music award or potentially a character award, but Jill's not new, right? Like, <laughs> so. No, but they really did expand on her character, but no, she's not new, unfortunately. Yeah, like I said, the potential was 100% there. It was just, uh, I think some corners were cut and it just wasn't, you know, especially since Capcom's been killing it lately with their releases. I think everyone has very high expectations and rightfully so, and they just weren't left up to. Again, not yeah. a terrible game, just not game of the year. Callie, how do you feel about remakes being game of the year contenders or being up for voting or nominations overall or remasters for that matter? I mean, do you think that, yeah, they get an absolutely equal chance or you're like, well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've had this discussion a lot at GameSpot, um, especially with uh, the Resident Evil 2 remake, because I totally agree that renewed my interest in Resident Evil. I think it's a really special game and was really difficult trying to determine how, you know, quote unquote fair is it? This game has a kind of a blueprint to work off of versus a totally new, uh, you know, fresh take or a new game or a, a cool sequel or whatever it is. Um, and we typically don't allow just regular straight, like the, the typical plug and play remake into that voting. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we do, however, um, take into account a game that really transforms the original in a remarkable way and Resident Evil 2 Remake really did that. So it, it's a, it's a case by case thing and it's really difficult to quantify again how, like where the line is. Um, for Resident Evil 3 Remake, I think it's, it's a case of, did it really do enough to invent or recapture the original um i would say probably not I, I agree with everything you guys have said i think um in our review alessandra folari basically said everything that brit said too like you know there's this Great really nice. good character <laughs> yeah seriously it was a, like a really good understanding of resident evil like the characterization is great but there's so much just not magical about that game um and we, we definitely draw the line at ports. Like if it's just a straight port, even if that game is great, no, we write that off. Um, but a game that's like really something different. I think Resident Evil 2 Remake is such a good example of that. And I feel bad to keep going back to it when we're talking about Resident Evil 3, but I think it really highlights the difference between those two remakes in that yeah. one really elevated the original uh, work and one kind of just did serviceable job and in some ways a really good job um like with the the art and the sound design but um just didn't have that Vanessa qua if you will um i i feel like i'm just like not making a lot of sense because to me it's so nebulous well, you are but... you are speaking my language i am smiling and nodding but i actually mean it when i'm doing it <laughs> hey, i i mean i up what you're laying down for yeah, sure for sure yes yeah, awesome um i Look, I just think when you talk about Resident Evil 2 Remake, like recapturing interest in Resident Evil, like that is absolutely what that game did. Like that is, that is the kind of thing that is like a game of the year nod worthy. That game really invigorated interest. I mean, for me, my, my little brother is obsessed with Resident Evil. He's played all of them. Like I've, I've watched him play a bunch of those games and I had definitely just kind of like my interest had really waned and uh, 2 Remake really recaptured that. and. And I, I do like the scares. I, I do like zombie game as we will talk about later, but um, I just it's just missing a piece. And it's, when, you know, when I, re when I edit reviews, sometimes writers will talk about like, oh, this game, like 
it should have this thing. And I'm like, well, you can't really fault a game for what it doesn't have. You really need to evaluate what's there. Um, but when you're talking about game of the year, it's a little different because it is really about like a magical feeling, like this game being above other, like a, a basic level. Uh, yeah, I'm just rambling at this point. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally feel you, especially when, you know, you're a lifelong fan of a franchise. Like, you know, I've been playing Resident Evil since I was about eight, which I don't re recommend eight-year-olds play that game. Please don't give me nightmares <laughs> for many years. But when you play it, you, you see the potential that could have been there. And it is a critical eye that even though Resident Evil is probably one of my top three favorite favorite franchises, it's it was missing that magic and i think a lot of that had to do with if when you look at resident evil 2 look at all the different scenarios you could play right leon and claire and capcom had built that story and, and made it intertwine and granted some of the puzzles were slightly different some of the objects were placed differently but the fact that they took that care to make that happen for that granted that wasn't the original but with resident evil 3 like that wasn't a priority that wasn't a thing that needed to be done but instead of taking that and maybe saying okay well we're not going to do that cool feature we're going to do something different with it they really didn't and they even reused the raccoon city police department as a big chunk of that game when you're playing as carlos like that's a reused asset you know so you can tell that like they were able to kind of like slip by a little bit and some of the story now andrea i know you've played resident evil 2 but i feel like maybe it's just because i i know the series i feel like resident evil 3 was probably a little confusing you're probably wondering who the heck is this brad guy why is jill in her apartment and she's waiting to why is she under house arrest i don't know if any of that even thought to cross your mind because i know you're just playing it casually i i think that it probably didn't dawn on me some of those narrative things because you and you were like hand holding me during that playthrough for the most part, right? And so you were able to tell me everything in real time, which I really loved. And so I think I can't even evaluate it as somebody who would be approaching RE3 having never played it because I didn't get to have that experience. I had the best RE tutor by my side through that whole streaming sure. experience. <laughs> So, but I, I, I'm with you. I think that we're all in agreement that this game was great and they did a lot of things well, but it didn't quite hit the je ne sais quoi magic that RE2 remake had last year. I obviously have no opinion about this because I didn't finish either game, but it, <laughs> your, your conversations have been reminding me of how I felt back in the day with Fable 2 versus Fable 3. Um, and so like, yeah, Fable 2 just had this bit of magic to it where I played that game for like hundreds of hours and then Fable 3 came out and I played it and it was technically fine right like it technically checked a lot of boxes that it needed to check but there was just something about it that was kind of off and it was really hard to pinpoint what that specifically was um and so it kind of feels like when you guys are talking about it it's a little bit of that yeah yeah absolutely nailed it that makes sense a lot of discussion so our third nominee for game of the year so far <laughs> is animal crossing new horizons animal crossing. i never thought i would see that ever in my entire life i know i'm what's and I, happened and the funniest part to me is that yeah out of all of us on the crew you are the one who's still the most invested in this game and i was like you shouldn't bother playing it you won't like it that's oh a true God. thing that steimer said to me my yeah. husband said it to me Brittany's like i don't know you might like it I told you to give it a shot. I was like, just give it, it's relaxing. You know, you sell turnips. I don't know. But now I'm going to say that million dollar bell loan you got, though, was probably the thing that actually pushed kept you over the playing? edge and kept you I going. Think, yeah. I think if you hadn't gotten that, you would have, you would have left. 100% agree. I cannot <laughs> disagree. I've said that over and over again, shout it again to Maria for almost threatening me into playing by saying i'm okay listen you're gonna play and you're gonna play for at least 60 days and i'm gonna give you a million bells to do it and i was like okay i'm ready i'll, I'll do it i'll commit so she gave me a million bells in my second week of playing and boy oh boy just getting a lot of money up front really changed the experience for the better <laughs> Like when I hack every game that I play of The Sims, I'm always just like, cash, cash, give me all oh, the yeah, cash. You have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I don't obviously want to judge the game based on that because there are clearly millions of people who played without getting a million bell loan up front and love it and are having a great time. You're with like it. the one percenter of, of Animal Crossing. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're, all the, we're all the grunts that are like working at McDonald's to start out. Yep. You just got a million ball loans. It's like Animal Crossing nepotism. Yep. Except she's not related to me, but that's okay. Um, but thank you, Maria. I appreciate that. I tried to give it back to her, and now she's like, I'm too rich for your opinion. <laughs> You're to drop in the bucket. Like, I don't even need the million. I've got billions. Yeah, she's like, your, um, your measly one million bell loan. I don't need that money back. Get out of here. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll keep it. <laughs> Yeah, man. I'm alone. I just wanted to off my books, you know. I finally paid off Tom Nook, and I was like, I don't want this hanging over my head. But yeah, get out of debt. Um, so Callie, Animal you've also Crossing. been. <laughs> yeah, Wait. that's the Animal Crossing story. You've been playing Animal Crossing. Oh yeah, I, I play every single day. <laughs> I've not stopped <laughs> since I got the game on February twenty eighth. I played oh, wow. every single day. Um, but Holy I mean, shit. I. I love Animal Crossing. I've played every single Animal Crossing game, um, except for the N64 one that was Japan only. And um, I played, I think it was Wild World, I played every day for two years. So- Wow, that's commitment. Animal, Animal Crossing to me is a lifestyle. It is a service game. It is my like, I played Destiny, but I was gonna say it's my destiny. Like I just like, um, I, I go back every day for like a new thing and I have, I have these like mini goals for myself and, um, I did review it. I adore it. And I really, I loved New Leaf. I didn't, didn't think that I could love an Animal Crossing game more than I loved New Leaf. Um, and I was so nervous about New Horizons when they talked about the crafting. I was like, this is going to suck. I am not going to like this. Like. It's not a survival game. I don't know why they're making me craft stuff. Um, and so I was really resistant to it. I and <laughs> yeah, I like, it's, too, it's it's a lot. It's a lot to to deal with. And I was like, you you mean you're gonna make me collect a bunch of materials every day? But um, I found that the the additions work their way into the key gameplay loop of Animal Crossing so brilliantly. Um, and one of the examples I used in my review was shaking trees. Um, early on in the game, shaking trees is something you can do to make money pretty easily because there's five wasps per day, um, I think a, a thousand bells, and then two furniture items um, from shaking trees. And shaking trees also gives you uh, twigs or I forget what they're called, tree branches to, to use in crafting. So it's like gathering a crafting material, but you're accomplishing a goal you would have been trying to accomplish in a previous Animal Crossing game. It doesn't feel like there's another, just another chore thrown at you. It feels really smartly woven into the gameplay loop that I already liked. And I think that terraforming, terraforming was another thing that scared the shit out of me. I was like, I'm going to ruin my whole island. I'm not, I'm not good at this. I can't believe it. This game is about making you like go to a strange town and like, blend in, not become like a god in the town, but I actually really love the customization. That's what's keeping me playing. Every day I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go around my island. I'm gonna see, okay, this is where I wanna move the museum. So in order to do that, I have to move this person's house and then I'll put my neighborhood over here. And I have this whole like, like 10 year plan for my island. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And it really is keeping me invested and I, I i know that people um animal crossing fans complain about like the lack of content but i i think that the rollout of events and stuff has been really smart um because it, it would be really overwhelming if you had art right from the get-go when you also have terraforming and crafting and all these other features to deal with i think the slow rollout of events has actually helped make it a little more digestible um, the, the power players don't care. They're like, I've already gotten a five-star island. I paid off my loan. I don't have enough to do. But I think for the average player, um, it's a really good way to like parse out those, those big tasks. Um, and I just love it. And I, I think you said earlier, Andrea, like you would never think to say an Animal Crossing game is game of the year material, but the way this has captured so many people, I, I do think that. COVID has had an effect on that. Um, people being stuck inside, needing something bright and happy. I, I do think that what this game is at its core is really strong. And um, I think the like the quarantine effect on it is, I don't say that to undermine what, what Animal Crossing New Horizons has done, um, because I really do think it's, it's such a well done, creative sandbox of a game. 
Um, and that's my spiel. You hit on so many great points. And I think that the pandemic is absolutely contributing to how many people are getting into Animal Crossing, including myself, because if I was traveling the way that I normally would be, and if we had a traditional E3, I definitely would not be hitting my rocks and digging up my fossils every day like a good soldier, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And what I really love about, you know, some of the thoughts that you mentioned was this idea of, you know, parsing it out. So when I was on animal talking with the what's good games crew we heard from animal talking of course is gary Witta's animal crossing show that is on twitch and if you guys have not checked it out it's phenomenal i mean he's getting people like shaggy sting eliza wood t-pain all kinds of people obviously what's good games is right up there with those oh, yeah i mean yeah <laughs> uh, um, yeah but Tim Schaefer was on our episode, and not only is Tim a, a lovely person, shout out to Tim Schaefer, but he said something that stuck with me that I've talked about on our show about Animal Crossing that he thought was poignant of the message that it's okay to slow down, that you don't need to get everything all at once, and that life is never going to allow you to have everything you want the moment that you want it that you are going to have to work for some things and it's going to take time is you can't just always throw money at problems. Right, to get Andrea. You want. Hey, listen, sometimes, <laughs> I sometimes I try, I'm like, okay, Nukazan, how many bells do I need? Um, but I think that it's a good overall message of Animal Crossing that took me a long time to learn because at the beginning, I like everybody was like, I, this game isn't moving fast enough. I have time to play the game right now. I'm mad that the game isn't letting me do more. And it's taken me months of playing the game now to fully kind of understand what you said about it's too much to digest all at once if the game is just like, okay, here's all the stuff you can do. And I think that that is a really different way to play. And sometimes it frustrates me, I'm not gonna lie. There's a lot of DIYs that I wish I could get, but, but I think overall, I really appreciate that sentiment. And it's something that has forced me to like stop and be a little bit more patient than I normally am. I think that one reason why I stopped playing was I felt like I couldn't, this is the only part that really bothered me. Obviously, there are some quality of life issues with the menu system and UI, but um, was more that I felt like I couldn't get a good read on exactly how to kick people off my island. <laughs> that was, <laughs> I was like, I don't want this person here. I want another one. I want another villager, but I don't know how to actually make you leave. And there doesn't seem to be anything online that's like a surefire way. And so I've just kind of like stopped logging in because I didn't want to go say hi to everybody. I do feel fortunate that I've kind of lucked out that yeah, I don't have cute ones. I don't really have a villager that I really hate. There is one villager that I inherited from Joey Noel. That's right. Kind of funny is Joey Noel, oh. who is this pig named Kevin, not Joey, the villager. Joey is a wonderful person. Um, <laughs> I would never pick Joey off my island. Um, but there's this uh, like he he's got like tiger stripes, but he's got is a pig. pig? It's weird. Um, is he a panda pig. Is he like a boar? A wild no. boar? He doesn't wild look like a But he, he wants to be the bouncer of Cloud Wine, which is the name of my island. He oh, like is mm. always out, out doing patrols. He's like, oh, I saw somebody suspicious. Oh, they're just your friend you invited over? Well, then never mind. Oh, and I was like, oh. don't call that person. Kevin. Just yeah. like, just chill out, out, Kevin. You don't, need, you don't <laughs> need that energy, Andrea, on Cloud Wine. I yeah, know. Cloud Wine's all about relaxation. <laughs> exactly. Did you like take his house? And terraform like a thing of water around him so he can't ever get out again. Yeah, like, the moat method. Yeah. Wait, is yeah. that real? Okay, so tell us about the moat method. I need to know what is this? Well, you trap them in the house and then eventually they get upset. <laughs> it's not <laughs> nice. So, wait, is this how you kick people off? <laughs> <laughs> this is it, Cyber. This is what you needed. It's a uh, kicking people off your island is actually so much more difficult in this game because they made it like they added a, a layer of like in, in previous Animal Crossing games like your villagers could just move out like if you didn't play for a week like you would return and your villager would be gone they don't do that in this game like they have to get your permission so it's harder to get rid of people but if you really hate someone you don't want to interact with them you can put a moat around their house and then they can never leave Nice. And then they'll get so That's sad. Oh, yeah, you can do that. Um, I the other thing about this game that was kind of added to my appreciation of it, I guess, is I worked on a lot of the guides, so I did have I wrote guides about like how to invite amiibo villagers and how to kick off people 
Weibo kick, kicking out is like the surefire way to kick somebody out of your island. Um, it's like automatic. But mm. I, I did a lot of that stuff, so I got really deep into the systems of the game through guide work. Um, which, I don't know, that's kind of like a it's weird meta. Pay yeah. to win. You're saying it's pay yeah. to win with the Weibos. <laughs> pay to win. Pick off your Hellenders. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> like the hey, like, has an amiibo, right? There's only a certain amount. Okay, there's amiibo cards for everybody except for Raymond and like, it's like the really popular cat that everybody loves and is kind of creepy I, about. I, I've got Raymond, and I didn't realize Raymond. I, yeah, I didn't realize he was so popular until oh. like one of my friends was like, "Yo, you could sell him for so many bells. You could sell him on no, Amazon no, for like millions. What's going on? Yeah, <laughs> really, millions of bells on yes. Amazon. Yeah, I so I got really into Amazon, and I am very active, and I I that's how I've gotten like all the DIYs that I didn't get. Um, so Amazon is this like other meta layer. I get really, I just I love Animal Crossing so much. But yeah, you could sell you could sell Raymond for like bank. Mm. Huh. He's... It's fascinating. Just yeah, to hear you. I, know. Know. I like Raymond. I don't <laughs> yeah, to... girl, Andrea, you could sell me for millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Never, but you have to start calling me Crisp, like Raymond does. He calls me Crisp. I Crisp. I got Crisp. you. I got you. <laughs> I got you. The thing with the, with the Animal Crossing, and I've talked about this, so I won't beat a dead horse here. Is just I, I understand the point of relaxation. Some of my favorite games of all time are the farming Sims. Let me just water my crops and pet my cows and give eggs to people, and they'll like me. But there is just not enough sense of direction. I don't get off on the decorating like Andrea does. Um, I don't, it doesn't like do anything for me. So with the lack of direction, and I think for me, just, I like to play at night before bed, but everyone's fucking sleeping. And no one, no, I can't do much of anything it felt like, or maybe um, that's because I was so early. At night, you what? can make your money, make your money tarantula hunting at night. Oh, that's what exactly what I want to do right before bed. Let me just go <laughs> <and tarantula. laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've always been intrigued by Animal Crossing, and I thought for sure this would be the one that hooked me. And it did for a while, but then I just... Then you fell off, and then when you went back, you had terrible bedhead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did, yeah. I was like, what is she talking about? I'm just going to smile and not... But yeah, when I finally hopped back in to do animal talking with the, with the ladies, my poor little villager woke up, and her hair's all messed up. There's like a cockroach in my house. I was like, oh, sorry. You have a cockroach in your house? It was like a bug. I was assuming it was a cockroach. It was yeah. something skittering along the ground. If you don't yeah, play for a while, like, your house gets infested. Oh my gosh. So see, I want that for a while. Want to play. <laughs> I mean, yeah, now I'm like, oh no, if I go back in, what am I going to find? I did log back in after like a week and a half or so, like just like, even like a month ago. And I, as soon as I walked out of my house, because it was evening, a tarantula ran up and bit me. And I fainted. <laughs> and I was just like, that bitch. What? Yeah, that's kind of how it felt. I was like, wow, thanks, Animal Crossing. <laughs> God, insult to injury. I know. That's your, funny, that's your warning to, to not abandon your island. I mean, I guess that the tarantulas will come after you. Oh it's, God! It's, it's scorpions now. Oh, sorry, scorpion. Oh, yeah, tarantulas are old news. Now it's scorpions. Oh, so they they change. Yeah, it's change with the seasons. Come on. Yeah. It's like tarantulas are six months of the year, and then scorpions are the other six months. So it's tarantulas and Australian stuff right now. Oh, if we oh. have Australian viewers, you guys have tarantulas. We gotta we gotta take a ship on down there. Yeah. I remember when we were first talked about the tarantulas. Steimer got a low key upset that they ran in bit people because Steimer, Callie, you might not know this, used to be a professional spider handler. I was a reptile what? wrangler. We had a spider. The <laughs> spider was just part of the crew. <laughs> <laughs> and you like, tarantula amazing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, the tarantula is not going to run at you and like <laughs> attack you. It's going to run away from you, if anything. That's the um, day if, to quote Alexa, I would backflip off the earth. If a tarantula charged me to try to bite me, that'd be fun. <laughs> that would be the really, final straw. Really fragile, like really fragile. If you kicked them, they would probably just die. Like you, you would be fine. Um, so, watch it, Brittany. Video games just aren't realistic, is what yeah, I'm, what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, the, the game where you have a bunch of anthropomorphic animals walking around talking yeah. is, you know, <laughs> not realistic. Shame. I, I mean, it, in this game, you can have a frog neighbor and then go catch a frog. So yeah. that exactly. was weird. That was definitely weird. I weird. Had a frog 
named Henry. He's great. He sings all I the have time. Henry. I love Henry. Isn't he great? He tried to leave my island once and I was like, Henry, no. This house I is so him. fashionable. Yes. He's got he's all that great. ironwood. He's cute. I went and I sold all the stuff that was outside of those houses. <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, it's like you know you need to build the house and there's like i want these things outside i'm like all right fine i'll i'll oblige and then they all moved in and i was like i don't even really like you that much i'm taking your stuff and i'm selling it back <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say anything and they still live there i mean as far as i know they haven't asked to leave i haven't logged in do your original villagers ever ask to leave or is it just like the new ones that come in anybody can ask to leave i I follow some data miners and I guess the way it works is like there's a cycle of like how many days has to pass after somebody leaves before another person will ask to leave. Um, and it, the factors include like whether you say yes or no and who it is. And so one method people do is there's a lot of soft resetting you can do to like if somebody asks you to leave and it's not the person you want to leave, you can reset and walk around and tell the one you want to leave. Because it, it's a pain in the ass. If you're not invested, don't do it. But I these are the things that i care about and i follow all the twitter threads but yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i there's a lot of people that care about it though like there's yeah. like so many threads about people trying to get specific villagers on their island and i'm like as long as they're nice i don't really care i think i saw justine play for like 24 hours to get raymond the one you have oh really yeah wow. i was like well, that's dedication People went ape shit for Raymond. I the the biggest thing about Raymond is because he doesn't have an amiibo card. Like that's the only way you can get him, um, is by buying him from somebody for like real money or hunting for like a full day. Um, I I'm that's where I draw the line. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, fair. I will do. I will play every day for a year. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will not pay, play for a 24 hour period. Just to yeah. <laughs> So in conclusion, I love the game. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. We, we are going to take a quick break to do some charity call outs. Don't forget, you guys, we are raising money for some great causes. But before we do that, I do want to ask you one final question, Kelly, about Animal Crossing. As an Animal Crossing diehard, how do you feel about time travel? I don't do it. I don't care about it. Personally, I get stressed out because I like the day in my game to match the day in real life. I found that it helps me keep track of the days in the pandemic world. So sad but true. If you want to time travel, it's fine. Be careful. Don't buy turnips. I don't have, <laughs> I just can't yeah. do it. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, I've thought about experimenting with time travel, but some of the girls that are in the Animal Crossing Discord that I'm in have spoken out very much like we don't time travel. Okay. We don't do that here. But then one of them <laughs> time travels all the time. She's like in December right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. like, I know wow. people want to do it. Yeah. But why, why would you, why, what's the key benefit? So the key benefit to time traveling is you get access to certain items and recipes that are only available seasonally. Ah, uh, okay. But yeah. the Animal Crossing team also only uh, reveals specific types of seasonal stuff the day that it launches. So some stuff you can get through time traveling and other stuff you cannot. Yeah, so I was going to say, doing doing their releases, like, I don't think that stuff is pre-built into the game. Or maybe it is. It's I don't not. Know. So, yeah. Like, the yeah. seasonal, like, items and recipes are, but the events aren't. So I don't think there's, like, a whatever the equivalent of Christmas is in Animal Crossing, I forget. Um, it's, like, tree day or something. Um... <laughs> <laughs> that's not in the game. There's no like Halloween in the game yet, but you can go to fall and like mushroom items are really cute. Everybody's really about the mushroom items. Um, they are really cute. I, I kind of want to get some mushroom items from Nookazan to build a little Alice in Wonderland and Man ha Mad Hatter tea party at somewhere on my island. Do it. Oh Do it. I love Nookazan. <laughs> Nookazan's the best. Uh, so for people Nukazan who are mogul. about Nukazan, it's a, an external website where people can advertise DIYs or items they have and you connect via Discord where you communicate like via DM where you exchange bells and visit each other's islands to do like a barter system for for items. Huh. It's it's all fan made and it's really sophisticated and like they they do a lot to make sure like somebody can't come and like steal all your fruit or like ruin your island. And people are like 
I was telling, um, I was talking about this on GameSpot After Dark podcast, like, it's the little bit of like social media interaction I have because it, it's kind of like a social media platform. People can review you and you DM different people if they have an item that you want. And everybody's super respectful. Like people stay right at your airport. Nobody like wanders. Um, there's like this kind of unspoken etiquette um, about how to trade. And it's so positive. I just, I need it. It's like a little bit of positivity. Aww. Um, it's, I would highly recommend it if you're into Animal Crossing. If you're not, it's just going to be intimidating probably, but yeah. 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 Probably not worth your time, but I could go on and on and on about Animal Crossing, but we have some other big games that we want to talk about in our discussion. So we're going to get to those in just a second, but I think it'd be a good time, Callie, to check in on um, how we're doing with fundraising. I know it's a little bit different with our discussion that we're not able to, to, pump the the donations like some of the gameplay streams have but we hope that you guys are you know looking at all of the information and if you can't donate do one step that you can do which is educate yourself about what's happening with the pandemic and also what's happening with black lives matters both things are very important and deserve your time and attention so i don't know how how you we want to maybe check in it doesn't look like we've moved the needle too much yet I've seen a little bit, so I'll just check in because I have both donation feeds. Like we said at the top of the show, we have two different causes, like Andrea just said also, uh, Black Lives Matter and Direct Relief for COVID-19. So I'll start with the Black Lives Matter feed and see if we have any new donations. I will probably butcher your name. And of course it logged me out. I think I still have the password copied. And That's all right. Well, um, we'll vamp for a couple of minutes while okay. you get everything good to go. I Oh, oh well, that was wow. that was quick. I I'm surprised it was that quick. So we've <laughs> we've got a couple donations and they're all very generous. So I'll read them out now. This is all for Black Lives Matter. Again, you can donate to Black Lives Matter with bit.ly forward slash gs dash blm. First one we have is a fifty dollar donation from Maria Afsar. Thank you so much. That's incredibly generous. Um, the other Thank thing about the the, the Black Lives Matter donations don't have messages, but the direct relief ones will. So um, if you meant to leave a message, I'm sorry, because I can't see them. <laughs> um, so thank you, Maria. Um, we have a $10 donation from Noah's Iqbal. Thank you. I'm so sorry about these names. I also have a we hard to pronounce for, name. Listen, we're known for butchery names on our show. So it, <laughs> it's true. It fit right in. It's a thing. Yeah. Um, we have a $25 donation from Nick Kelly. Thank you so much, Nick. And finally, a $50 donation from Justin Foshi. Thank you oh, so wow. much, everybody. He's wonderful, so generous. And of course, you don't have to be donating huge amounts. If you can donate anything at all, we very much appreciate it. And like Andrea said, definitely educate yourself. Um, you know, not everybody can donate, but that's something you can do. Um, all right, I'm going down for, there's a lot actually of uh, direct relief donations. And I see one from our friend Joey Noel. So I'll start with hers, $10 from Joey. Greg is kind of okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually have a lot of messages about Greg. Uh, <laughs> Mizuki with a $25 donation. Way to shoot the guy on the ground. Oh, wait, is this from yesterday? Maybe it is. It probably is. Yeah. But I do want to read the Greg. There's a lot of Greg messages that I find very interesting. But shout out to Joey. <laughs> if you if we read that yesterday, shout out to Joey again. Shout out to um, Joey always. Yeah. Um, so I'll probably, this is probably a backlog of messages. We got one from Chris that's $10 with Greg doesn't suck. <laughs> These are I, definitely I, from, from yesterday, but shout out to Greg. <laughs> so um, for people who are a little confused, yesterday our friends at Kinda Funny played with Lucy in some war zone, and I particularly liked the clip that they pulled out of them say, singing. <laughs> Lucy, come back. It was pretty fun. <laughs> or um, one of right. Kinda Funny. Oh, uh, 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 kinda See yeah. what I did there? I did. Mm, that was really I did good. <laughs> Um, so I'll read some yeah, new 
some new ones that come in. So we have a $50 donation from Trevor Starkey. You all rock. Oh, thanks, oh, thanks Trevor. Trevor. Thank you so much. We have another $50 donation from Foshi15. I think that that person also donated to Black Lives Matter. So thank you so much oh, for the double yeah. donation. In our community, Foshi gives our community gift subs all the time and is a supporter of ours on Patreon and is all around an awesome, generous person. That's awesome. Um, thank you again. Oh, we got, wow, a $100 donation from Project Turo. Oh, awesome. It is incredible. Thank you so much. Then I just want to shout out the most recent donation from Anonymous, who definitely heard me say that every little bit counts. A $1 donation from Anonymous. Thank you. I'd, I'd like legitimately want to shout that out because, like I said, any little bit counts, anything you can give. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, and just to reiterate, we'll probably read more donations at the end of the show. So if you are able to, continue to donate you can find the links just below our wonderful faces and yeah thank you so much to everybody who has been donating to both of these fantastic causes as kelly mentioned we will be reading more donations once we're done with our discussion and we will be taking your questions i know chastity is calling for questions in the chat on the GameSpot channel and we'll be looking for questions in the what's good games channel because we are hosting on twitch and i see that some of our subscribers have found our new emotes which is great <laughs> and uh we're gonna go ahead and continue on with our discussion on game Games of the year so far because these next two games are probably going to be a lot of discussion. The first one is one that I never thought that I would be talking about as one of my favorite games of the year. It's Final Fantasy VII Remake. Oh. <laughs> so, Brittany, you want to set this one up for us? Ah, uh, yeah. So you see, Final Fantasy VII Remake is a remake, more of a reinvention of Final Fantasy VII. So what's interesting about what they did with this remake, I, I like to call it a reinvention, but it's technically a remake, is they took the first five or so hours of the game, which take place in Midgar, and they turned it into a 40, well, my playthrough was 40 hours, into a 40 hour game. And I would say, more or less, the, the reviews on this have been incredibly positive, but there are some concerns from people regarding the padding of the game. Some people felt like it was it was too much. There's too much fluff, too much unnecessary side quests or fetch quests, if you will, um, in between the main plot points. But I would say for the most part, people are uh, they're really feeling it, including one Andrea Renee, including one Christine Simer, including myself. Callie, did you play this? I didn't finish it because okay. I did have to move on a lot of stuff with work uh, but the review cycle goes i know <laughs> <laughs> the review cycle is is unrelenting but i will say i think that it's definitely an example of what we talked about earlier of a remake that does more that earns its spot in the current year it makes it contemporary and, and makes it eligible for a discussion during like a 2020 game of the year discussion so I was just blown away by what they did with this game. And we'd been seeing this for a couple of years at press events from Square Enix Japan. And really the animation, I think, stood out first and foremost to people who are fans of the original. It was like, wow, they took these iconic Final Fantasy characters and reinvented them with all new character models, but still really paying homage to their original art. And I think that that's something that's not easy to do. And they absolutely deserve a pen on the back for a job well done. Like I just kept stopping in awe during all of the cutscenes of this game. And even the gameplay, which we're seeing here looked fantastic. And that's really difficult to do. And I think that we're really seeing a lot of studios push the envelope with what's being done with photorealism. And I think that games like Final Fantasy VII that are clearly <laughs> fantasy based really need to you know, kind of shoot that gap between looking too video gamey and looking photorealistic. And I think that Final Fantasy VII Remake absolutely crushed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I'm, now I'm distracted watching the gameplay. Because like, <laughs> I'm just remembering, and like, I think touching off a little bit of what you said about uh, the animation of them all, I really liked how, especially in combat, they not only nailed the look of them, you know, as they're walking around the world, but they, they all felt different in combat. So... You know, Barrett feels very heavy when you're running around with him. 
Aerith feels like, wee, I'm a maid. Uh, and then, you know, just <laughs> people go in there to beat things up. So, like, it's, it's, I think it was really nice to see that they all not only visually looked different, but also played very different. Um, and that gives you a little bit more variety if you were like, I've killed this. Cause, like, yeah, those things were annoying. Um, <laughs> just like so many of them all over the place. Uh, it when you're hacking through all these, these levels, eventually you kind of like want to mix it up. You get, you get to hop around to everybody else. Oh, the Abzu, that, oh. and, but you know, it's such a rewarding combat, to, combat system too, because once you really get it down, you feel like such a badass, especially when you're like doing all this stuff and then you push, oh, I don't know what the tactical menu is to bring it up and things slow down and they're mid motion and then you execute all these other commands. And I was really impressed with the combat system and I really liked it. When I first played this at E3, oh God, was that 2018? I think it was 2018. Uh, I just remember being like, it's, it looks complicated, I think, if you don't know what's going on. But once you get the hang of it, I think it's really intuitive and I think it's a great system. It's a way to reinvent the combat of the original Final Fantasy VII, which was purely turn-based at that time. And it's also worth noting that there is a mode in here that you can have more turn-based combat if you wanted to, but this is the standard mode that we're watching. Yes. I really found it such a nice balance. And I know that some people who are diehard turn-based fans, you know, didn't really like how action-y it felt. But I think because of how well they did the third-person combat, it brought someone like me, who is not a fan of turn-based at all, into the mix. And I actually enjoyed some of the more turn-based moments because I think that they really had this nice hybrid, which is so hard to nail. We've seen a couple other games attempt to do these like real-time strategy elements mixed in with combat. I think another game that did it really successfully was Dragon Age Inquisition, even though not a lot of people used that mode <laughs> um, in, in, in Dragon Age. But I think what I really loved about this is that I felt like each of the individual characters really felt unique in their combat play styles, along with combining what the items were. Now, I did say that I thought it was a little bit challenging to learn what all of these items were if you're unfamiliar with Final Fantasy VII naming conventions. Yeah. Because some of them are a little obtuse. And I eventually found... Wait, phoenix down doesn't... <laughs> yeah, it's like... Of, it's literally a tuft of feathers from a phoenix that raises you up. What? I mean, like, when you think about it, it makes sense. But the game doesn't really handhold you through how to use any of these things. You really have to dig into text menus to figure out that part of it, which I didn't particularly like, but I didn't care enough for it to bother me because the gameplay was still so much fun. And having no context for the story whatsoever, I thought that the story had a really great beginning, middle, and end. And it did kind of jump the shark a little bit at the very, very end of the game, which, you know, <laughs> we won't talk about. But I think overall, I never expected to be so hooked on what was happening in this game that I was up until like two or three o'clock in the morning every night that I played this game because I just could not put it down. Yeah. I liked the, um, I do think it's it's interesting about the ending because obviously we won't talk about what it is, but I was definitely like, I understand it. I understand it. I understand it. I understand it. What the fuck just happened? So like, <laughs> that was, that was, but then uh, we did talk about it off, which again, I won't say what we did, but when we, when you and I discussed Brittany and like we're really diving into, um, very spoilery territory on what it all means and like how it all plays out. I was like, oh, actually that's really cool. Like you, that one, it does require you to go and look it up on the internet basically, or go find somebody to talk to with it. That's a little bit more knowledgeable than you. Um, but it, it is something that even as somebody who's not super into Final Fantasy, I really appreciated once I understood a little bit more context behind what was going on. And if you did understand the context of what was going on, it was one of the most holy effing shit aha moments I think I've ever had. I was playing the game and I just started yelling very loud. And my poor husband was like, what the fuck is going on? Are you, are you okay? I'm like, blah, blah, blah. I need to understand. But no, that, and I mean, I also just want to talk about the music too in this game. I think the music it just complements the game from so many d directions. And it's just some of the best, I, I mean, it was already so good the way it was in the original game, but they took it and they're like, oh no, we're gonna make it better. And you say to yourself, I don't know about that. And they're like, oh, just you watch, just you sit down. And then they, they freaking did it. The game, the, oh, they're, one of the songs is called like the underside of a pizza or something. I don't know what it's actually you called. Not want a pizza. Why would yeah, you Yeah, I don't know. It's something like that, steel pizza. There's a pizza. I only know because there's pizzas in there, but like that was one of the best tracks. As soon as that kicked in, I was like, holy shit. 
when you hear a very iconic boss theme, that was one of the most, again, like amazing moments, I think, in, in a boss and during a boss fight that I've ever experienced. And it's just so incredibly exciting what they did with it. The fact that they're able to expand on all of these old characters, like with the original Resident Evil 3 that were so one-sided, I felt like so one-dimensional. You know, you got Jesse and Biggs and Wedge. And granted, they had some interesting personality little clips and quotes, but they didn't last very long in that game. In the original one, they were around, you know, like I said, maybe max of a couple hours where you really get to like chat with them and interact with them. And then they're gone. But in this one, they really fleshed them out. And I enjoyed and appreciated all the extra side content that some critics, I think, didn't like because I felt like otherwise, how else are we going to get to know these characters as they are? Like, what are they like outside of Avalanche? And that was a really interesting perspective that we're able to get. <sighs> and that I, you know, just to kind of continue on that sentiment, I think that that was what really defines this game as being such an amazing piece of work in the sense that this is a this is a full remake right like you had mentioned Brittany that people were complaining diehards were complaining there was too much filler and i would say i didn't think that there was too much filler i think that there was just the appropriate amount for what we got from the built the built out systems in the world for example take wall market and that whole oh. level around wall market and how if you didn't have those little side quests doing like the squat contest or going, you know, back to the brothel and all the little yeah. things that you can do, you wouldn't get to see the amount of love and care that got put into building out Wall Market, right? All of the nooks and crannies and all of the world building and the art direction and the the voices of the NPCs all interacting that, that, that really made that section of the game feel particularly alive. Right, like there were, of course, like you, we could nitpick about some of the side quests, but I think that I never, it never once crossed my mind, wow, this feels so annoying. I don't want to do this. I felt like this gives me an opportunity to go explore a section of the world that I probably am never going to see if I just mainline the story. I'm going to miss out on the world building that was done in this game. And I think that that is maybe sometimes lost on people when they're trying to like, oh, I, I only want to play this game for X amount of hours. And it's like, but you're missing it. Somebody put a lot of love into this little corner of the game. And I really enjoyed taking the time to explore those moments. Yeah, I don't, I, for me either, I don't think it felt like too much. Um, I completed every side quest in the game and I was like, they could have technically added more. They didn't need to, obviously. But um, for me, it was like the right amount of, of filler, if you will. I thought, you know, kept me satisfied, kept me intrigued. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just so remarkable, too, that this game was in development for so long and Generally, when that happens, it's kind of a big red flag, right? It's like, what what are you really expecting out of it? But the fact that they just execute it, in my mind, darn near perfectly, uh, as perfect as a video game can get, is just insane. So definitely uh, this, and I think one of the other games we're going to talk about right now is definitely top contender so far for 2020. Oh, Daddy Sephiroth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, like, I thought this game had such a great ending with everything that happened, I, you know, in the final, in the final chapter, which I mean, it did feel like the longest chapter I've ever played, but I was like, before that very, very, very final scene, I was like, oh, this could just have been, this could just have been a game. And then when Brittany is going into detail about what else is to come in Final Fantasy VII, I was like, how are they going to make this into just one more episode? <laughs> oh, they're not. There's no way. <laughs> it will be made until we die. I was yeah. going to say, yeah, it'll probably still be going. <laughs> yeah. Old. When I'm 80 years old, they will still be coming out with the remakes <laughs> of this. Oh, oh, my gosh. I think I just recently read that they just started mocap for part two or part Ooh. two of it. Yeah. Well, so, hey. Yeah. It'll be another five years but it's yeah. oh, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping the dev cycles will be shorter now that they have like hopefully the engine down and most of the assets more. built a lot of the like systems that, right? are built it should knock on wood make it go slightly faster um mm -hmm. but yeah, we'll see it does give me yeah. plenty of time to play i think i'm gonna take kind of like the summer lull period where not a lot of stuff comes out especially with kind of the delays that we've seen um I take that time to play my boyfriend keeps telling me like you will love it like you have to just like just dedicate time to it and so i'm really excited and we did give it a 10 out of 10 which is a uh, a rare score we gave a couple games a 10 out of 10 in a short span but it is a rare score for GameSpot and for that us that's essential um and so to me that's like I, I have to play it it's something that you know my colleagues deem essential um, and I think that absolutely 
that just guarantees it a spot when we're talking about game of the year like that's gonna be in our talks so um i'm very excited hearing you guys talk about it just makes me want to play like just like play right after this so, do it i right. like i've never thought that i would contemplate going back and playing this game again but who knows maybe i maybe i will maybe i'll just go back to walmart and do do the squat contest from now until the end of time <laughs> <laughs> So you like, I'm just do. gonna see how yeah exactly do that one <laughs> yeah, I man. really just want to play the honey bee in scene over and over again oh it's so brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> it's so good I will really say good. I kind of I kind of botched that that dance scene where you, you know and poor Aerith she was looking up she's like oh as I was up there it's cloud dancing it's like oh, I'm Aerith <laughs> I know it sucked though because I wanted to just watch cloud move I didn't want to have to you know follow the stupid little thing that was moving around I thought it was a cute mechanic though and also I just want to give shout out to that scene because the original Final Fantasy VII, that whole Don Corneo's mansion, the Honeybee Inn, that whole thing was, you know, problematic. It, mm, problematic yeah. is a good word, good good word for it. And in today's world, like just uh. so, uh, <laughs> and I, th I thought the way they handled it though just went was incredibly great. I think it was a wonderful message that they sent, and I'm, they executed it. That was also like that was always one of the things, right? When they do remake this game, how are they going to treat that scene? How are they going to what are they gonna do? And good job. But no complaints. Although I did suck at the dance scene, like I said. You just Before needed I... a freestyle mode, is what you wanted, right? A what? A freestyle mode. Yeah, absolutely. I could have done like the Macarena on the stage as Cloud, done the like, chicken oh, dance. That would have been good. Oh my gosh, Cloud doing the chicken dance. I feel but like I... that needs to happen. Try to twerk a little bit. <laughs> I, I feel I feel like a, I'd a, watch that. Andrea would be great at twerking. You what? I feel like Andrea would be great at twerking. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh yeah. That like no question. Mm-hmm. Just built into his blood. <laughs> well, now that we have finished gushing about Final Fantasy VII Remake, one of our favorite games of the year, I think it's time to talk about the game that everybody's talking oh, about. Oh god, I don't know if I'm ready. Um, and we are going to do our best to keep this as spoiler-free as possible. Uh, there will probably be some very mild or light spoilers as we talk about characters and scenes. So if you have not yet played The Last of Us Part Two, which is the fifth game on our Games of the Year so far contender list, you may want to just pause or join us in about 15 to 20 minutes for our Q&A session. And otherwise, we'll keep it as, like I said, as spoiler-free as possible. But if you haven't played yet and you're trying to go in blind, first off, congratulations if you've made it this far. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and, um, and not seen anything. And we will be doing a full spoiler cast for What's Good Games, um, which will be our episode coming out this Friday. So if you want to get into the nitty-gritty, look for that. But we're not going to do that here. So, Callie, have you finished The Last of Us Part Two? I have. I reviewed it and I did two different versions of the same review, one with no spoilers and one with spoilers. So I have really done some deep dives into it. We also have a spoiler cast. It's It was occupying a lot of my mental energy. Oh my god. I, I just bet. finished a couple days ago and it's all I can think about. Mm. I didn't know you did a spoiler review. I'm gonna have to go check that out before we do our, our recording later. I've been trying to go around and read more reviews, but I missed that one. Yeah, uh, it was a, a kind of an experiment. We've never done anything like that. And I thought that of any game, this one warranted, uh, especially with the embargo restrictions, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Oh, um, yes. Your intense. <laughs> very limiting. And so I figured, you know, some people are going to want um, an opinion on this game that has no spoilers. And I'm going to fulfill that need with this spoiler free review. But for people who want to process it, it's it's the game it's the kind of game you really need to process and parse and think about and that was my justification and it actually paid off people di i didn't think people would click on a spoiler review um but they did so uh yeah, that was the the thinking there but um god that that game like haunted me for like a full week after i finished it i couldn't even like do anything so in a good way or in a bad way uh, I guess overall, I would say good. Like I, I think it's a very heavy kind of miserable sort of game. But um, you know, I gave it an eight. Uh, and my my justification for that was I think it is really just a fantastic character study. I really love what Naughty Dog did with 
mm -hmm. the, all of the women in this game. I mean, it's not just the women that are good characters, but I, I think that you, you really get to see how Ellie has been affected by Joel's actions in the first Last of Us. And you know, when, when people ask, like, was a, was a sequel necessary? Um, the original Last of Us, I, you know, maybe before I played this game, I would tell you I don't think so, but I loved seeing ramifications and consequences of Joel's actions and the exploration of that in this game. Um, that's ultimately why I landed on on liking it. It's, it's you know, it, it was really hard to play. I think I played like three hours a day because I did have a lot of time with it before the review, which was awesome. I don't often get that much time with a game when I'm reviewing it. And that helps so much because I really couldn't play a lot at a time. It's It gave me nightmares. Like, not in a I'm scared way, just in a, like the, just the weight of the everything that's happening and the stress and it's so tense. Um, so it was hard to say at first if I liked it. I, I had to think about it before I could really determine what I felt. I know exactly that feeling. And the longer I sit with my feelings on it, the more that I'm able to fully understand how I feel. So when we talked about the game, so Steimer got the advanced copy for What's Good Games and gave her full thoughts on the game, also spoiler free, um, the first week that we could talk about it. And then the next week, I came back after having played about 15 plus hours of the game and I just had like all of this like angst about it. I was just, mm -hmm. I was mad. We literally named the video The Last of Us 2 made me angry because it did. Like there were so many yeah. moments that made me angry and I think a lot of people misinterpreted that as I didn't like the game and I thought the game was bad and I'm like, no man, like I, obviously I have like a couple issues with the game which we're going to talk about in our spoiler cast but I think the game is phenomenal in a variety of ways. The, the idea that a game at all can make you feel anything is a testament to the work that they did narratively. And I think we all agree that Naughty Dog is one of the standouts in the video game industry of doing really impactful narrative work that makes people have feelings about things. Because there's a lot of games that don't. I mean, they might build a really cool narrative, but it doesn't necessarily make you feel anything. Yeah. It was like, that was cool and that was it. You know? And then you move on with your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is definitely not one of those games where you just like brush it off and you're like oh that was a that was a nice trip well, okay cool whatever <laughs> yeah no this is definitely i mean this was a game that i talked about on the show i i journaled my way through it because i i mean i first of all didn't really have anyone to talk to because i was playing it before and then also because i just felt like i i needed to process what was going on or what my thoughts were during it and that really helped me to where at the end i didn't really feel any confusion I kind of knew exactly how I felt but I also after talking with other folks who had finished the game realized that I had taken a much more optimistic spin on some of the things that happened whereas they did not so like I can understand why that would maybe make you have different feelings about the game in general um so uh so yeah I mean I this was by the by far this is my game of the year and will be a difficult one to unseat simply because of the way it made me feel and the way it impacted me. Um, and I think that that's just something that's fairly rare in games. And that's not to say that there won't be incredible games coming out later this fall, but it's hard for me to imagine having a similar experience like I had with this game um, with anything else. Yeah, so I just finished it a couple days ago. So I'm still in that processing mode. And Callie, it sounds like you've been thinking about it for like a week or you were thinking about it like for a week straight. And I find myself just sitting here and all these ideas are popping in my head. Like, what is the symbolism of this? And what could this mean? And what could that mean? Was this action justified? Well, how, and I, like Andrea keeps saying as well, it made me feel and it's still making me feel. And so then I find myself going down this rabbit hole. Then I hop on my the phone, look at the internet, look at all these theories. And then I just find myself getting depressed. And it's just like this cycle of like, I gotta just like let my brain do its own thing on its own. But something interesting is um, I finished the game and I had to finish. Well, when I started this past weekend, I had only maybe like 10 hours into the game. So I played about 20 hours over the course of two days. So I didn't get to, you know, like stop every few hours and whatnot, which actually I would say I, I was never so disturbed that I need I felt the need to stop, which is something I'm excited to talk about during the uh, spoiler cast, because it sounds like that's that was a common thing that a lot of people had. Um, 
but after you play it and then you hop into let's say like another game you really realize how well done and how well polished and well executed that the last of us part two really is because i started playing another game and i talked about i'm playing ghost of tsushima that's not this game i'm not referring to this game and I was like, man, this this feels like a video game. Like this feels gamey. And I know some games go for that route, but it was really a, an eye opener. You know how well and immersed and cinematic those Naughty Dog games really are. And yeah, I'm just this is the first time I've talked about this game out loud, so I'm rambling. So I'm gonna stop right now. But I'm processing all of my feelings and emotions live. Live. No, that's that's good. I think like that's huh. that is what this game is really kind of instilled in the community is this sense of discussion and this sense of you know let's talk about how this game made us feel. And unfortunately, there are some very divisive opinions out there. And you know, I myself included really struggled to verbalize how I felt about this game in the beginning. And I think taking some time to process is has been very good for me. But there are still some things that I just you know, don't like about some choices that were made, but it doesn't mean that, you know, Naughty Dog is a is a terrible developer for making those choices and not like I'm finger wagging at them. It's like, no, I just like, it's okay that I didn't like those choices. Yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. There are some things narratively that I struggle to understand. And it's not, again, that abstract thinking of symbolism. It's more of, was this a right choice for the game? Does this make sense? You know, when I play something like this, especially a game like this, like I said, I really try to put myself in that person's shoes, that character's shoes, and, and get where they're coming from. And I think for that reason, I'm able to avoid a lot of the uh, stresses of some of particular actions. Because like, okay, if I'm them and this is my motivation, this makes sense, I'm doing this. But there were some choices and some actions by certain characters that I didn't quite understand. And I, and I wrote it all down. I didn't journal like Steimer, but I did chicken scratch a lot of stuff. So I, I was struggling to process it. So I was writing all these things down and I was like, okay, I still couldn't come to a conclusion. I even tried to like write it all out and I couldn't. So again, excited to talk to you guys later about it. But um, yeah, there are a few things that I don't quite think were necessary or needed in this game, but we're still in there. But that said, still one of the best games I think I've ever played. It's just, yeah. mwah. Yeah, and I know we've talked a lot about the story, but something that they also did really excellently with this game, which absolutely sets it as a game of the year contender, is the world building, environmental storytelling, and atmosphere building. Oh. That's something that The Last of Us, the original game, also did very well, and I think they took it even a step further here. And I can vividly remember like specific scenes where I would just sit in cover for like minutes at a time. Mm -hmm like trying to figure out how I'm going to get through this level because I know that if I make one wrong move, like all of these clickers are gonna descend on me <laughs> and, panic, and I'm gonna die a gruesome death. And so very few games really accomplish that kind of stealth gameplay so excellently as we see in The Last of Us Part Two. And I wanna give a, a shout out here to our friend Steve Saylor, the blind gamer who came on What's Good Games Live to talk about the accessibility options that are in the game that really allow many different types of gamers to experience the stealth gameplay that maybe haven't before because stealth games are traditionally very brutal and very difficult and by definition, unaccessible. And I think that Naughty Dog absolutely deserves accolades for the work they did to take this really phenomenal stealth gameplay that they've created and make it so that as many gamers as possible can play it. The, the accessibility was the first thing I looked at actually, because when I start a game, um, I always like to enable subtitles. I have a really difficult time following the stories of games if I don't have subtitles and I watch a lot of TV with subtitles. Um, so that was like the first thing I did because I wanted to be able to pay attention and, and, and really take in everything that was happening. And so I just spent like five minutes digging through the menus and I was so impressed and like, then, you know, the stuff that you don't think of as accessibility, like um, motion sickness options. Um, I have a friend who I, I, my old roommate who played through The Last of Us um, a couple years ago and she has really bad motion sickness and it was such a struggle. And like, I literally tell people like, she loved it so much, she dry heaved her way through that game. And it was, it was a lot. But I, the first, she was the first person I texted when I saw those accessibility options. I was like, there is a whole motion sickness thing. Like you'll actually be able to play this game without taking Dramamine. Like you're gonna, you're gonna love it. Um, 
And it absolutely deserves accolades for that. I, I think that's something that's kind of getting overlooked in the discourse around this game because there's a lot there's a lot being made about you know killing dogs or the level of violence or whatever it is. But um, you know, we we really can't overlook that because I think it's a standard that a lot of uh, at least AAA games should be able to hit and should should emulate. So yeah, I absolutely agree. It deserves m much more than just a tip of the hat for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm almost willing to overlook my grievances with some of the plot choices to say that this could also potentially be a game that will be hard to unseat, as Steimer said, because of what they've done with accessibility and how they've innovated and pushed forward. Because when we talk about Game of the Year in our discussions, one of the things that I always hammer home for my personal feelings about games that I look at as Game of the Year contenders are things that are pushing the envelope, whether it be with story, with animation, with gameplay. And I think mm -hmm. that Naughty Dog kind of like hit a bunch of those check marks with what they did with The Last of Us Part Two, And the fact that I didn't appreciate certain story choices does not take away from the innovation that they did have with this game and the phenomenal work that the development team did in building this game. Absolutely. I, I also just want to give a little bit of a shout out to the combat because like some of the, the footage we've seen we've been seeing, uh, I was so impressed when I first saw it at E3 a couple of years ago, like how fluid Ellie's animations look and how it almost looks like scripted sequences. And I think because you're you're if you get caught, right? Like I you play a lot of stealth, but if you get spotted or heard, you do have to do a lot of running and maneuvering to get out of those sticky situations and the way that is animated makes it so like harrowing and tense and it's it's just beautifully executed i think yeah there's that one chase sequence i'm like nope oh yeah all right go ahead Brittany. oh no i was just gonna say i also liked all the different items at your disposal with the combat you know if you want to try to be sneaky squirrel like here's the thing is i suck at stealth so i was talking about this that i turned on the go invisible while stealth Mo or while prone, while rather. Prone, Excuse prone, me. Yeah. While prone, yeah. Uh, promo. So I, if I got caught, I could just go into prone, and I was like, okay, this is gonna help me get through the game in the weekend. But when I try to be big brave girl and not use that, I would like, to, I'd like to think of different ways I can fuck them all up, right? So I liked always having that glass bottle, and if I would, I would throw that down, and then I would, well, no, first I would like lay down one of those trap mines, those little whatever I think they're called trap, the wire yeah. mines, yeah, you know, <laughs> whatever. Lay one of those down. You throw a bottle. Everyone comes rushing. And then they just all like explode. And then behind you, it's like, then I'll quickly switch to my shotgun because I know I'm going to get bum rushed by who knows what then. And then I have my Molotov over here. And so I really liked how there were just so many different ways you could approach a crowd. And that was really fun too. Oh, yeah. My, my, I love I love getting them together. I don't do the trip mine, I just do the Molotov. So, like, all the for this is really only works for clickers or infected, but yeah. Noise maker over there, Molotov, watch them all burn, eat some popcorn go on with your day but then sometimes some of the enemies would burn and then they would stop burning and then they would just start walking around so i lost faith in the molotov i'm like that's not powerful uh, enough i mean yeah sometimes you yeah. got it depends on where they are on the periphery of the fire but yeah yeah and they'd be running around like hey, hey, and then like uh oh and they're like yeah, I'll burn. <laughs> Because yeah. if a clicker running towards you wasn't horrifying enough, an on fire clicker running oh. towards you is he? Yeah, that's a big old nope. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there was a couple of really fun moments of, of, of gameplay that you know were really harrowing for sure, and I think that that gameplay really shines a lot in the more exploratory moments of the game, and that's something that I really appreciated that they opened up this time around because there was obviously a few of those moments in The Last of Us, but nothing compared to how much you can explore in The Last of Us Part Two. And I just really enjoyed some quiet moments that you could just completely miss if you didn't take the time to fully explore some of these buildings and things that were, you know, intentionally placed in the world. And I really think that a lot of games struggle to find the balance between wanting to encourage exploration but also rewarding that exploration and that's something that this game did very well i mean obviously there were, you weren't going to find something around every corner and i certainly opened plenty of drawers with nothing in them but just like my life <laughs> there's nothing there <laughs> But overall, I think that a lot of the exploration felt worth it, especially when you would open a building and you would see like a hole in the floor and you're like, oh no, 
I know oh, yeah. what's in there. You're like, uh, I do, wanna... I wanna, do I want to go this way? I actually had one of those moments and I was like, do I want to do this right now? Yeah. It's like, maybe, I, uh... I'll, maybe I'll go back outside real quick and like take yeah. another lap around the neighborhood, see what's up. <laughs> Yeah. It's something that was so dang satisfying that it's a simple thing, but it made me feel so good is breaking the glass on these buildings. Yes. yes. Oh, there's a whole t Twitter thread dedicated to how that was all animated and the sound was recorded and I, I'll find it and retweet it on my channel. But the idea of like, here's this building, you know, a lot of games are like, here's the building, you can't go in it because there's glass windows and you're like, no, I could, I could in theory smash that. Or if like the bars are placed just hot, like wide enough where you know you could squeeze through, this game lets you traverse all of that. So finding the glass building, you're like, okay, that's a building I can go in. And being able to break that in, it did kind of give you that sense of like, I'm not supposed to be in here, but I am. What goodies am I going to find? And it was those often, oftentimes in those moments that you would find the notes, find the collectibles that would give you some backstory on the building that you just had explored. And uh, that was really special too. And I think that was so integral to the world building of that game. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I definitely mm -hmm. had, thankfully it was very early on in the game where I was like, oh man, yeah, this building, I guess I can't get in there. And then I just stared and looked at that glass for a minute and I was like, <laughs> Yes, I can. <laughs> I was like, yes, I can. And I threw a brick and got in there and was like, ha I have outsmarted you game, although this is what you intended me to do the entire time. This so. is what makes it feel good, right? You're like, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think we could keep going and going about like some of these really fantastic moments, but I think, you know, to kind of wrap up our, our discussion on some games that were really impactful for us, Callie, do you have any final thoughts either about The Last of Us Part Two being a game of the year contender or any of the other titles that we've seen so far this year? Yeah, I, you know, it's Last of Us is, is such a difficult one because it is a very complex, like, there's a lot to unpack with this game. Um, and I, I, I think that's fascinating and valuable. And so I, I definitely think it's a contender for me. And, and it's so weird to, to compare that to something like Animal Crossing, which is just an entirely different, it doesn't even feel like they're in the same medium. They are so different. Yeah. Um, and that's gonna be the trickiest thing because it, it, I think it comes down to like, what is a game of the year for you? Is it something that captures like, is it, is it something that's kind of a phenomenon? Is it something that sparks discussion? Um, it's obviously a very personal decision. And it's, you know, I've, I've started a second playthrough of The Last of Us, and I think that's going to really make or break that, that game of the year status for me. I I loved it more on the when I started the second playthrough. I, I appreciated the little things a lot more. I wasn't, like, constantly nervous about who was going to die. So I was like actually appreciating some of the the mechanical design decisions um so i think when i get through my my second playthrough i, I think i'll have a better idea excellent yeah simer watched me play some parts of the game and i was being very reserved and she's like oh, you'll you'll be fine here you you don't have to be scared yeah, well, i was like i was like first of all do you do you want me do you want me to tell you whether or not? Like, and I was like, yes, tell me. She was like, yes. I was like, okay, you can chill. Nothing's <laughs> <laughs> gonna kill you in this room. You're okay. And I was like, you have a uh, here coming up in like five to ten minutes. <laughs> that's, that's it. Uh, my boyfriend did that for me for Resident Evil Two Remake. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. you, you can use some more ammo. You're okay. <laughs> Helps. Yeah. Yeah. What a hundred percent. Steimer, do you have any final thoughts about Game of the Year so far? Uh, no, I think as I, I kind of already touched on it, like I do think, and I think to Callie's point, it it really depends on what you as a person really look for in your game of the year. Um, but I do think for me personally, it's going to be hard to surpass The Last of Us Part Two. Not to say that other games won't do other parts better than that game, but I, I think emotionally wise, and like just because there's so many layers to to dig into of that game and, and thematics and all that fun stuff. Like I honestly kind of felt like I was taking a college course afterwards where I was like trying to dissect all of the things. Uh, yeah. But I really, I really liked that aspect, but I can definitely see how that is not something that anybody would always want from their game. They might be like, no, no, no. My game of the year is like something that's a little bit more chill or something like Animal Crossing, although there's a lot of layers to that too. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, I just think it, it'll depend, but for me, it's, probably going to be the last of us i think the other one that is upcoming that it has potential is like cyberpunk so. oh yes Brittany. Mm, mm. 
yeah, I'm, I'm still unpacking. I'm still, you know, I need a, probably another week before I'm fully like, okay, I think I understand how I feel about this game. But like I said earlier, I think in terms of quality, Tilu 2 is one of the best games I've ever played. Um, it's now more about me processing, like, what does the story mean to me? How does the story speak to me? How do I feel about the direction this game went in? But um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with Steimer at this point. Between, although it sounds like Steimer's more leaning toward t 2 I'm kind of juggling right now between Final Fantasy VII, t 2 I think Cyberpunk's going to be right up there as well. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot, Andrea. It is a lot. And with lot. the delay for Cyberpunk, I think that that is inherently going to impact its ability to win hearts and minds for game of the year for 2020 because i think people aren't just just aren't gonna get enough time to yeah. evaluate that game before a lot of the voting discussions have to take place before the end of the year and that is to me a little tragic but i don't think cd project red is going to suffer any oh, no. if they don't win game of the year for 2020 it just means they'll have probably a few less trophies on their shelf but um i think they have to build some more anyway so it's fine they need yeah. some time <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But I think that there's, you know, a lot of interesting games to come that could potentially be contenders. I know Assassin's Creed Valhalla is certainly up there as one of my more anticipated games for the fall. And I think that, you know, there's games that I th I think will surprise us too, you know, like, but I mean, I think everyone knows that C Cyberpunk is really like the de facto big contender to Tilu right now and the rest of the games are kind of like hey maybe there's a dark horse out there and maybe someone watching in chat has a dark horse nomination that they'd like us to to discuss in the q a so thank you everybody seven, like a dragon sorry i get that out there of course but um thank you everybody for checking out our games of the year so far discussion now we're going to check in once again on all of the donations that have been happening for these fantastic charities that we're raising money for today with our friends at GameSpot. And then yeah, I'll give you guys a couple minutes to, if you have questions for us, either about Game of the Year so far or about anything else for that matter, uh, you can drop those in the chat and we will try to get to as many as we can. So Callie, where are we at with uh, some donations? Right, we've, we've gotten some more donations. I'm really excited because we have some friends in the donation uh, list here. We have the wonderful Steve Saylor with a $25 Aww. donation to Black Lives Matter. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, we're actually going to have Steve on uh, GameSpot After Dark this week also. So um, it's a big lovely. end of this whole production. Um, and then we have a $25 donation to Black Lives Matter from Alessandro Filari, our very own editor here at GameSpot. What's up, Alessandro? We've known Alessandro for so many years, and he's like one of the few people that I run into at what it feels like at every single industry event that I go to. And now that we aren't going to events anymore, I feel like I've seen you in forever, Alessandro. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. Uh, but I, I'm, he's he's lovely, and I'm glad I got to shout out his uh, Resident Evil review as well yes. on the show. And if you guys want to check um, out his work and, and Callie's work, don't forget, Gainsaw.com is where you can find all of their writings and musings and, and videos and articles and all kinds of other great coverage. You guys have a pretty deep bench of people writing for you these days. We do. We, uh, you know, we, we have, I think, a, a smaller team than you might expect, but we, we really do a lot. And, and um, I, I really do love the team that we have. So um, I'm always excited to A, shout people out on the show, but also just to work with everybody every day. So thank you for the shout out, Andrea. Hey, of course. I think you guys work hard. You deserve you deserve the accolades. Um, True. And then speaking of GameSpot employees, over on the uh, direct relief donation page, we have one from our own Richie Bracamonte for $20. He says, I don't know why I've held out this long on playing Last of Us 2, but you ladies got me hyped to play it, downloading it this weekend for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Richie. And then again, from Steve Saylor, $20 to Direct Relief. Hey, all love you all very much. So thank Aww. you Steve. so much. A nice guy, that Steve Saylor. Yes, he is so. just, a, just a wonderful human being. Mm. So oh, um, once again, thank you to everybody who donated. I know we have a, uh, still have a little bit of time left and we're going to be doing the Q&A, um, but we, we really do appreciate just anything that anyone can spare um, and just, you know, 
spreading the word that we are doing um, some charity stuff here at GameSpot. So uh, we really appreciate everyone who tuned in. Yes, ditto what she said. <laughs> I'm, and I was told that you have some questions and I know we don't, probably don't have like, I, I've been watching the chats. I know that a lot of people were kind of focused on some of their own discussions that they were having. Um, so if you guys do have questions, you can keep dropping them in the chat. We do have eyes on both the What's Good Games channel chat and of course the GameSpot channel chat as well. But you have a couple questions? Yes? I do, I have, I have a handful of questions from the mostly the youtube chat a, chat a couple from twitch first one is from charles washington on youtube here's a question does halo if they knock it out of the park have a goatee chance oh yes, yes. oh I, yes <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah i think Brittany and i are one of the, the big halo fans here at wgg this is definitely one of those dark horse contenders for sure i think the fact that we haven't seen anything about halo infinite is either really bad or really good i don't <laughs> think it's gonna land in the middle <laughs> yeah it's like flip a coin we'll figure it out later There's so much writing on this game you know i think a lot of folks weren't super pleased with halo 5 i didn't mind it personally it wasn't my favorite by any means but this is going to be a title that we're assuming we know is going to launch on um, xbox series x and there's just so much writing on this that I'm really, really anxious to see, uh, you know, I'm hoping it's leaning toward that really, really good, like Andrea was saying, I hope they're holding all of their cards to their chest, but it's about time you start letting those cards fly into the wind. Start building yeah. that hype, because we don't have that much time left. I could see a reasoning behind not doing it, only because, I mean, and I'm not trying to diminish the game. Or don't the rain game on genre, our hype parade! But more of like, I feel like if you know you like Halo, you probably don't need a lot to sell you on it, therefore they're PR beats leading up to which does it doesn't need to be like a year-long campaign for this game um, because you kind of know in a certain sense what you're gonna get and if they have anything like super new or exciting maybe they want you to just play it and like go forth and see well I, 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 I'm trying to be optimistic here no no I think <laughs> I, I definitely appreciate first off thank you I appreciate the optimism from our, our resident <laughs> salty host but I think that in my mind, I the reason why I was a little concerned about it was because I think that this is an amazing golden opportunity for Xbox PR and marketing to recapture people who were really big into Halo in previous generations and maybe have been away from Halo for a long time. Maybe they just stopped playing shooters. Maybe they got busy with life and stopped playing games overall. And now with us all being home and not traveling as much and people playing more games than they probably ever have before, that there's an opportunity to say, hey, did you used to love Halo? Did you have a great you know, time playing with your friends? Or do you have memories of experiencing Master Chief's story? Well, we want to bring you back into the fold. And I appreciate what you said about, you know, there are always going to be those diehards that are going to pick this up and get their Series X on day one, no matter what. I don't think those are the people that Xbox needs to sell. I think they need to sell the people who are like, you know, five was just okay. Yeah, the multiplayer did some really cool things and was successful, but the campaign was like, I don't really know. And I just feel like Halo hasn't had like a, like a giant win in a long time. I feel like if we don't see anything decent at their upcoming showcase, like first party showcase then that's when I'll worry. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's... I understand also, like, what both of you are saying. It's like, well, if, if you're gonna... Halo is Halo. Halo carries a lot of weight. But like Andrea was saying, too, you know, the people who maybe were into Halo a couple years back, maybe around Halo 3, Halo... Maybe Halo 1 through Halo 3, and they dropped off around Halo 4 and 5. You know, there are a lot more shooters on the market now. And if someone just enjoyed Halo primarily for the shooting mechanics or whatnot, that market is so much more saturated now. So if you do have something really cool and exciting that's going to re-innovate, I mean, that's kind of dramatic buzzword, but do something cool with the genre, like you got to start promoting it. Because I think that you got to build that hype for those people to recapture them. But You got to let people save money to buy that expensive new console. True that. <laughs> When is their first party thing? It's soon, yes? It's sometime in July. They, yeah. Callie, they haven't confirmed a date yet, have they? I don't I think, so. think so. Yeah, um, okay. You just said, like, yeah. July. July. Yeah. I, I'm definitely one of the people that needs to get sold on the Series X more so than Halo, but I, I didn't... If you're going to market specifically to me, Microsoft, if you're listening, I would say oh. you just have to, um, like, retcon everything you did to Cortana in five and then fix cortana and then i'll be 100 percent on board with halo yeah. infinite like i'm oh, yeah yeah one of yeah. those people 
Yeah, so, no, I'm with you. There's a lot of us out there. I think that's what kind of left me with a sour taste in my mouth was everything that went down with that whole part of the storyline. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping that 343 can bring it back. Yeah, I mean, people play Halo, oh, they, yeah. want, they want Chief and Cortana. That's the dynamic. Cortana yeah. Chief, let's go. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for your question. Yes, thank you so, thank you so much. I will move on to the next one. Charles Washington, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back to the second one and because it's in the question is actually about Series X, so that makes a lot more sense of what we just talked about. This is from Dovahkiin e Scrolls on YouTube. Excellent top tier name. What do you think of Xbox Series S or I think it mean I think they mean X? Yes, or Lockhart. Oh, they're talking about the digital. Oh, digital. Yes. That hasn't Oh yeah, so there was a that that rumored like photo that was going around, right? Of what it looks like, the little, the little mini, mini fridge. fridge. And mini I thought, fridge. I mean, I think the form factor of that little mini one looks great. I think mm -hmm. that it's smart of them to make it smaller, PlayStation. <laughs> um, if it's gonna be all digital, it's like why make it so big and have it take up so much re real estate on your home entertainment system. I think that digital is a wave coming that you cannot escape. And as a physical collector, Brittany and I talk all the time about our physical collections. Like I'm sad that I had to like abandon my physical collection of games, but we all knew it was going to happen eventually. And apparently this is the generation. I still don't think the rest of the world is ready for that. When I say that, I mean like the telecommunications industry, I mean like the hard drive manufacturers and a variety of X factors that are not the console makers that make it challenging for a large number of gamers to assimilate to an all digital future. Yeah, As a minimal, the one minimalist of the group, yeah. I welcome our digital future. Please come to me. I want no stuff in my house. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're in a place right now where we can start testing that. And I think that's it's exciting, but also I'm kind of like, oh man, but it's okay. Like I also have too much shit in my house. Like I, I, I don't need anymore. It's fine. But yeah, we're, it's interesting that we're finally in a spot where I feel like we can test out these all digital consoles and test out this all digital future. Like Andrea was saying, I think we're very, ways, way, ways off before that's all you're going to get offered or just digital only because that's not going to work. But it's going to be fascinating. I hope we get the data to see what the breakdown is between who buys physical, who buys digital, because I'd be very curious to find out. Well, it's over 50% now as I'm far as the consoles. As far as like the, oh, the, the, the additions, the digital edition versus yeah. the disc edition. Yeah. So, I mean, I've already put my flag down that I'm getting the disc version because I still enjoy watching Blu rays. And I'm glad that both of the consoles are going to be doing 4K Blu rays. I think now with this generation, 4K TVs are much more prevalent. I didn't upgrade my HDTV to a 4K TV until. Um, Xbox One X was re re was released, even though both of the previous consoles were capable of doing 4K. And it's because like 4K TVs for the longest time were still just too expensive. And 4K gaming monitors for PCs are still very expensive, but at least the price of 4K televisions feels like it's come down a little bit, so it's more approachable. And I think that that to me as a gamer is still important. So I'm gonna, I'm team disc still. Disc list, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna do disc list too. I'm thinking I'm gonna do it. I know uh, I'm gonna do it. I have I do not have a single disc in my house. Oh. Oh. I, I have so many. I wish I could live like that. Yeah, I I would want to be discless, but I I'm afraid of the um inevitability of getting a physical copy of a game. We mostly get codes now. We mostly get digital copies of games for like reviews. But occasionally yeah. I'll get a physical copy and that's when I don't want to be locked out of a review because of the way that games are distributed. So I feel like right. I'll have to do disc version, but I would ideally do the digital version. I think in all my years covering games, I've only received two or three physical copies of stuff. Really? Yeah, it's all codes. I mean, granted, like it's, I've only been getting game reviews for maybe like five years now or whatnot, but uh, yeah, craziness. Nintendo yeah. sometimes sends physical copies, but that's totally separate, obviously, um, from this discussion. And I, I feel like it's really dwindling. Like, maybe you'll get a debug disc, in which case you need a whole other console anyway. So, right. maybe yeah, I'll just debug. bite the bullet and go digital. 
Yeah. And thankfully, debugs have kind of been a little obsolete in the digital future that we've been going to, which has been nice. I mean, I recently talked to somebody on a PR team about if we had a debug, which we do not because we don't do nearly the amount of coverage that you guys at GameSpot do when it comes to like capture and guides and walkthroughs and all that. So we just don't really have a need to have a debug. But for people watching, what we mean by that is we mean a developer kit for the console. So this is essentially a special type of console that developers use to design games and very few May, let me emphasize very, very few gaming outlets get access to these debug consoles from the console makers themselves because you just don't really need to have this really expensive piece of machinery. The regular consoles typically work fine, but um, especially now. Yeah, exactly. Like back in my yeah. day, I worked, I, I had some debug units. And yeah, we definitely. Yeah. Definitely done a review on a debug unit, but it's been a while. I feel like that was that was on a PS3 debug, I think. So I I would say I haven't. Maybe I'm just I'm being too neurotic about my how holding on to the discs. Maybe I should just accept the inevitability of the future. You'll get, get there. That. Trust me. It was hard for me too, girl, but I got there. And now I, I, yeah, every time I have to buy something physical, I still get the collector's editions because like, I like to display them. But as far as the games go, I'm like, nope, I can't do it anymore. I just can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still am all about the collector's editions with toys and stuff. Like, I think, mm. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to outgrow that. Obviously, like my collection of tchotchkes is nothing compared to Britney's very intense collection, which you can see just a sliver of behind her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not all of it. That's just a fraction of her collection, Callie. Uh, she has rooms, whole rooms of her house full of stuff. I love that. That's I, I love that. Like, Thanks. never change. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Stammer calls me a hoarder. I, mean, I do. are a hoarder. I mean, I am not a freaking I'm gonna kick your I, mean, I miss you. You're a very organized hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, listen, I don't have pathways. All of my hallways are open. There's just, no, I'm joking. It, it's all good. But um, yeah, I know. But it, it's the reality of like, I like the collector's editions, but I can't buy any more things. I just can't. And it took me a long time to get around to that, but I'm there now. I don't have room. I'm not sure. Once Dragon Age 4 collector's edition is announced, you'll be changing oh, your yeah. You know it. Oh, no, I'm still buying collector's editions to the day I die. There's no doubt about that. But, like, physical goods and whatnot, I'm trying to be a really good girl and stay away and not do it. I'm trying. Good for you. Thanks. Like, my house will just be full of statues. My bed will become a bunch of different statues just surrounded by all of the collector's edition things. Yeah, that's not, that's not bad. Wake up and I look at my left, there's Kratos. Look to my just right, like, there's Geralt. Good morning. Let's go. <laughs> girl. That's a very yeah. intense pairing to wake up to. <laughs> I know, right? Especially like you just see Kratos judging you. He's like, "Be better." And you're like, "Oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, be better." Yeah. You only got seven hours of sleep last night. Be better. I know. Uh, I'll try. Yeah. Uh, well, we Definitely. are running out of time, so maybe yes. we have one more question. Yes, I, I did want to say I would definitely love Geralt, more Geralt statues um, to wake up to, but that's just me. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll do one more question. Let me see. Um, I want to make sure I pick like a really, really good one. I guess this kind of fits the, the discussion that we had. Um, this is from Jacob McCourt on YouTube. I may have missed at the beginning of the discussion, but are there any indie games that you haven't spoken about that are on your radar for game of the year? Um, for game of the year, sorry. I did that wrong, but yeah. Hmm. This is a tough one because we haven't gotten as much time to do indie games as you would think knowing that we're not traveling because a lot of the games that i've seen so far for 2020 that i'm interested in aren't out yet yeah mm -hmm. I, I think um, i mean like I, bugs. I really... bugs thanks was... is that game coming out this year holiday 2020 oh, they said nice um did any of you play murder by numbers the picross murder mystery game I've heard about this, haven't played it yet. It's, I really like it. It's really cute. Um, it's like a, a strong, like, 
indie contender for me. Like I said at the beginning of the show, my game of the year last year was Disco Elysium, which was one that like was a complete dark horse for me. Um, and so I'm always excited to check out smaller games and indies like that. I would, I would definitely recommend if you're into Picross at all, Murder by Numbers is super cute. Like just, it, it's so much more than I expected it to be. The premise is just Picross game, but it's a murder mystery set in the 90s, but it's, it's more than that. Um, I definitely wanted to give that game a shout out. Yeah, yeah. I like perusing the the marketplaces and looking at these fun little indie games. My problem is I spent a good solid month and a half or two months playing all the Yakuza games back to back, and that was at a time when I probably when I would have had a lot more time to check out the indie games. But I feel like with the games we've been getting recently, they've been pretty beefy. The review copies of the certain games we've played. Final Fantasy VII was beefy. Tulu Two mm -hmm. was beefy. What else was there? RE Three that was unfortunately not very beefy at all. Uh, having the time, time to play these games has been has been difficult yeah like, and I, despite the fact that we're home all the time now and i think that's a really good point to bring up too is because i'm thinking about it usually i play a good handful of dozens of indie games every year because i really enjoy them especially for co-op experience there's some real gems in there but yeah it's with everything going on and i was talking to andrew about this earlier you think since we're home all the time, we have all the time in the world to play new games and dive into new experiences. And it's like, actually, I mean, obviously there's life stuff going on on the side, but it's just been really busy too with everything going on. Now the E3 lasts 13 months, you know? It's the never ending <laughs> summer of gaming, make it stop. The gestation <laughs> period of E3 has exponentially increased. God. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It, it's just like it's been it's been challenging for sure. I mean, it just as a what's good, I know that a lot of outlets are doing more content than we would have done normally because we we don't have to travel, and so we're just we're streaming more. We have two episodes of the show now. I mean, there's certainly games that I'm looking forward to, but I'm sorry I don't have a better answer yeah. for your question. I just haven't spent as much time with indies this year as I normally do. But definitely looking forward to Ooblets whenever that game comes out. God, I'm so excited for Ooblets. Right? It looks so good. I cannot wait. Um, the, the reason I, I chose this question is just because I, I always want to remind myself that like the game of the year can go beyond AAA. And um, I guess I hadn't thought about it until I asked the question from Jacob McCourt. Um, I, you know, I haven't really dedicated as much time as I normally would to indies, and, and that's something I kind of want to rectify. Although, if I could give Game of the Year to the Yakuza uh, Cabaret Club mini game, I would do that. Love the Cabaret I Club knew, mini game. I knew I liked you, Callie, but like it just went up a whole new level, baby girl. <laughs> she there. just Good talked you. about Tiger. how much she loves that mini game on the show last week. It was like a whole thing. It's, it's top it's so notch. It is top notch. I want a whole 40 hour experience dedicated just to that. All Same. the makeovers, all the hand signals, let's go. I would pay full $60 for that. Oh yeah, go. and I'll pay the $20 yeah. DLC add-on. I don't care. I'm sure. Oh, nope. We're going to have a good future, you and I. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm that we're going to have that. to have you back on the show to talk about more Yakuza in the future. Like dragon. We can talk about that. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> mm -hmm. You've got those people that are your people with Yakuza. Oh, yeah. I'm joining the fan club. I'm late to the party, but I'm here now, bitches. Let's go. Let's do this. GameSpot has a whole group of Yakuza fans, and they call themselves the Crime Boys. Um, but they, they oh. like, originate. It's like this group of us who are all like, let's talk about Yakuza. Um, it's a, we have a huge Yakuza contingent is what I'm trying to say. So nice. if you ever want to talk Yakuza, come, come to us. Join the crime boys is what she's trying to tell I want, I'll join the crime boys. I don't care what they're called. So what do we got to do? What's the initiation ritual? <laughs> 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 well, Callie, this has been such a delight to chat with you. And it's been so wonderful to uh, work with GameSpot again to help raise money. And I know that, you know, we didn't do gameplay, which is what some people were hoping for, but I think that this conversation is a fun one to have as well and kind of think about what we've played so far this year and, and hear from you about your thoughts as well and kind of give us all like a reminder that, yeah, there's some games that I miss that I should maybe go spend some more time with. So thank you so much for having us and thank you to everybody who took the time to donate. Don't forget, these charities are still accepting donations. You guys are going to be doing this stream for a few more weeks still. Um, yeah, just to echo that, uh, 
thank you guys for having me. I had a really great time talking about this and I definitely play Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, and the charity links will be open for a, a couple more weeks. Um, so you can see the, the links obviously right here. They're pretty short and easy to remember. So if you wanna keep donating, you can absolutely do that. Tomorrow, we will have Mary Kish at 1 p.m. PT, Yay! so that's tomorrow's stream. We love Mary. We love Mary. So that's what's going on tomorrow. Um, thank you again to everyone who asked questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. And thank you all for donating. See you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.